Hey guys, welcome to Rough Stuff Podcast number 18. I'm Garrett, Rough Stuff CEO. I have Zach, uh, Rough Stuff President with us. Hey. Uh, Mallory, Rough Stuff CFO. Hello. And today's guest is Keith Grano from Selway Machine and Tool. What's up, Keith? Hey guys, how are you? Glad to be here. Appreciate you being here, man. Well. Absolutely. Would uh, would not miss it. Thank you very much. We're super excited to have you because not only are we, I guess, a customer or client of yours, um, we've known you for a long time, but actually we have some other sort of family history where you've mm-hmm. worked with Garrett's mom for Correct. a long time with Sierra College. Yeah, yeah. I met Garrett's mom, Carol. God, it has to be. I've been up here for 20 years now, a little over 20, so at least 15 years ago. It's wow. funny that she she's, she's bought, she bought machines from you before we did yes yes she did yes <laughs> yeah. she did of course and that's the neat thing this whole area she kind of kicked it off you know the uh lab and the sierra college program was a huge huge influx for a lot of the schools up yeah. here the schools have been tremendous and i feel like carol started that i mean yeah. she was the first one that kind of kicked all those sales off she was part of like the rockland high school thing too hundred right? percent yeah hundred yeah. percent her and dan frank they've been That's humongous right, yeah. advocates for uh selway machine tool yeah they, and they have what cut like a, a mill or two and like a, a lathe like an sg10 over there i think right at at, 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 uh, at rockland, rockland? Yeah. oh my god they, they are up to uh eight machines <gasps> now oh, wow. oh my god yes gosh. yes that's where my daughter's going and yeah that's, yeah. A, that's a high school high yeah. school yeah, that's crazy high school if you that's look awesome. at uh, so Haas Automation, obviously, who we are their uh, very big customer of theirs. Um, we look at the uh, number of schools in this area and uh, not only Rockland, but uh, Oak Ridge High School has six machines. Folsom High School just built a three and a half million dollar machining lab and wow. have nine new Haases. Whoa. Yeah, crazy. El Dorado High School over on the uh, Placerville side. Just bought two machines from me. Kennedy High School, one of the biggest advocates, again, for us, he and Dan Frank, which is Rob Green down at Kennedy High School, uh, nine machines, including a UMC, five axis, and live tool lay. The the high schools in this area, Haas had said, uh, you are one of the biggest supporters of the schools, and the schools, in turn, uh, are hugely supportive of Haas. So it's incredible. That's, the numbers are amazing. School is so much cooler than when we went. Oh, I was going to say, I went to the wrong high school. Yeah. Yeah. It just wasn't around because I actually, I didn't tell you this ahead of time, but I toured Haas with Carol oh. when um, I worked for her when she, I don't know if you remember at Lincoln High School when she was doing the iDesign program. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, we toured and things like that. I worked for her as an assistant for about a year for the CACT program. So, no, great. Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. Pretty so funny. That was, uh, God, that was probably 2006. I was going to say early, about mid range, yeah. about when I met her almost in that, because I remember the eye design and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. good stuff. So and that what was did you fun. think of Haas? Um, honestly, at the time, I had no experience, no yeah. knowledge. I was more interested in anything not that, <laughs> but I just didn't have any. She took me on as like, uh, you know, Hail Mary for me, doing me a favor, giving Very me a job cool. at Sierra College because I was a student there. So it was a part time student job. And I just did admin work. But she took me to everything. There was like all kinds of projects and interesting things. And it was when the STEM program came yep. out and so many neat things. But honestly, I was not mature enough to appreciate them well, like I do now. It's very interesting looking back. I, I had people would ask us what we did and I had no idea. Yeah. I couldn't tell I couldn't <laughs> yeah. tell you. That's how it was when I got into this industry. People would say, Oh, what do you do? I always sell machine tools. And they're like, Oh, you mean like wrenches? I'm like, yeah. no, <laughs> CNC metalworking equipment. They're like, yeah. no clue right over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same. Exactly. But the interesting thing, that's uh Haas, we've talked about this thing, Garrett and I have talked about this um, because of COVID, we can't get customers down there. We generally mm-hmm. take, mm-hmm. you know, a number of customers go do factory tours twice a year. Yeah. It is a phenomenal place to v- visit. It is incredible. 1,300 machines a month they pump out of Oxnard. Wow. wow. And it That's is, a lot. yeah, Jeez. it is amazing to see the cleanliness, mm-hmm. how organized everything is. And uh, the staff, the neat thing is I started with Sully in 94, and these guys have all been the same guys I've known mm. that have been there. We've all kind of grown up in this together. It's it's amazing. Well, them way before me, but still. 
Do they have a huge amount of staff or are they a huge staff wise? Yeah. Or? So automated. yeah, they are very <laughs> automated. <laughs> they are. Yes. They, they went for, they've got, I think it's up to about 1300 pallets oh. of FMS systems. So full 24 wow. seven uh, automated uh, machining centers. Uh, but I think they're staffed at about 1400 uh, currently, if That's not big. maybe a little bit less because of COVID, but in that range is where they were prior to COVID. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, That's it's incredible. Ass. It yeah. is. They're awesome. So we have a ton of questions. Yeah. So firstly, we want to know about your story and your background in equipment sales and because that's how we know you. So yeah. how did you get into it? You said that you didn't have a ton of knowledge no. and I think you said you started in 94. So where yeah. did you come from and how did you find Selway or that's did they a, find you? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, it's, it's you know, back in 94, my wife and I, who I met up in, in Chico, and we were we were done, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, let's just get going. I want to get out of here, get a job. And so, um, I had known Bill Selway for a number of years. Grew up with one of his daughters in particular, Marnie Selway. Her she was a class above me. I graduated in '89. She was '88, and we were super tight. So I was always over at their house. Bill Selway, absolute legend, icon in the industry, created Selway machine tool from his dad passing uh, in 1963 and took it over at the age of 18. He was gonna go ahead and uh, uh, I think he was going into business school or something, but the dad had a heart attack, passed suddenly and took it over. So as we started going through and, and, and I didn't know what he did. I was like, you know, we're going to concerts together. We're going to the Rolling Stones and <laughs> they're like, they're grand. Oh, you are awesome. Let's keep doing this up. We went to Elton John and all these things. And then one day his older daughter, Jamie Selway, we were at, um, the hop fest which is the hop yard is a, a brewery in, in pleasanton and mm. it's like grano you'd be more perfect working for my dad and i'm like really well what does he do again yeah, what's he doing? <laughs> yeah <laughs> what are those yeah so no clue but i always knew i kind of wanted to be in sales like i just have you know huge interest in people and, and interest in what they do and I got into this in September of 94 and, and, and went through service for three months. So learned about the machines, fixing the machines, understanding what they were, spindles, castings, way loop jets, uh, everything that makes up the machine and how it runs, which was huge uh, education in itself. And then once I was uh, in the sales part of it, I was like three weeks in there. I'm like, dude, cut me loose. I'm ready. I'm done. I, I just want to go do this. And uh, this one's I'll never forget. So my one of my first calls on my own was a company called Blue Dolphin. They were in Santa Clara. And um, uh, the guy, you go in and Selway is so known in the industry, right? You 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 go in, you, hey, Keith, with Selway? I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm here. And uh, he goes, oh, yeah, come on in. And I, he didn't know me from Adam. I didn't know this guy. He's like, come on into my office. Nicest guy ever. And he goes, you want to go up on the roof and, and see? I'm, I'm making this part that's going on the Mars rover. And what? I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yes. I want to go up yeah, there. Yeah, I want to see that. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of what just, I, I never look back. And still today, um, having no experience coming in, but learning a ton from my customers. I was those I was that kind of guy that would stay in the shop and ask dumb questions and always ask, you know, what, how come you're setting it up like this? Why are you using this kind of tooling? You know, um, and they would laugh at me, but they were, they were so, I was so interested. They were like happy to tell me. So I learned a ton through my customers and just doing a lot and seeing a number of different applications. So here we are. Um, can't believe it's been 20 going on 28 years. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, so had Silicon Valley for my first seven years with Selway, and then I've always had this area in Reno. Um, so moved up here in 2001 with the family and my first daughter, and then three, two more daughters later, and uh, 20 years later, Mallory and I were kind of talking about this before you guys came in, it just blink of an eye, mm. you know, just 20 years goes by so fast. Bet, yeah, crazy. So a lot of kind of on the job training more than actually, you know, sitting looking at books. Exactly. Yeah, totally. more getting what you got to know. Yeah, totally. You're you're right. It, it was a lot of books, though. It's because it's technical, right? So, uh, but a lot of on the job. You, you're, yeah. you know, just reading. I remember they tell they told me early on here, just learn Haas. Just learn Haas. They're an up and comer because 94, we got in Haas in 88 when they started. And that's when all the territories for all the distributors and the dealers around the country were defined. If you picked up Haas... You're pretty much still that dealer today. You haven't really lost anything because of that. 
um, or because of any shifts, we still have Haas in, in Northern California, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington. And we've branched out. We have an office in LA, but we don't sell Haas. We sell Toyota, uh, Eurotech, uh, Matsura, which are one, two, and three, Wachion, which is a phenomenal Korean product. And those go in our other areas, which is now Utah uh, as well. We've, mm. got, we've got an office in Utah. So, no, you're mm-hmm. right. But throughout it all, ton of on-the-job training. Ton. So is that how it kind of works where it's like this company has territory to sell this brand in yep. this area? Gotcha. So yeah. they can't like can't outbid each other. I didn't know that. That's very interesting. Yeah. In fact, we have to a lot of times when you go to a larger company and you have, uh, you know, they request three bids or you have to get uh, a sole source letter that we are the only distributor. Sorry, you can't buy this from anybody else. Uh, the territory is defined. And yeah, it's been like that wow. since we had Haas in, in 1988. Wow. Yeah, pretty That's incredible. That's been your guess since then. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. And and again, I think back then, the Selway brothers, right? It, it, if you don't know that story, there's there's seven Selway brothers. And oh my gosh. Bill Selway is the oldest. And, um, and all of them are in the industry except one. Um, but they are, oh, and they have a sister too, and she's a nun. <laughs> and, and yeah, it's it, it, they, they are a phenomenal family. I mean, it seems like if you know Selway or the name, they're in the industry, uh, whether it's nephews, cousins, uh, whatever. They, they, Selway and, and machine tools are synonymous. Um, but yeah, it, it's 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 uh, it's been a long time that that, that all those have stand, stood since we've since we've had the product in '88. Yeah, I think talk awesome. to your customers like that, like like learning as much as you can adds like a lot of value even to like us obviously because like we yeah we didn't had zero experience coming into machining yeah so like i i think i would like reach out to you and like hey we're making this like what do you suggest like you know like i the only other person to reach out to would be a machinist who yeah. probably just wants my business versus telling me how to you know what to buy good call yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah definitely no yeah. and you're right and so many and i think that's the that's what you just said is is the biggest thing you know your parts but i know applications so mm-hmm. understanding what those parts should go on and what's the best fit fit for those parts makes a huge difference because like mm-hmm. you said you're like oh i think we could do this on the mill we just had a a customer of mine very good customer up in the orville area call me up send me hey keith can you do a turnkey on this and we're like yeah we looked at it and it was a full on if you look at it five axis part but then if you have um there's so many different ways of looking at it right because if you give one part to 10 different machinists they'll come up with 10 different ways to make that part which is a great thing because everybody's always thinking of of quicker faster ways of, of setups and 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 change in application but we went from maybe going five axis to doing it in a lathe so there's not wow. a turned portion on this part but if you have a lathe with dual turret, dual spindle, all live tools. You could do pretty much a lot. anything yeah. you want on a mill on the lathe and and maybe do it faster at a bar stock than you would have cutting each individual piece, mm-hmm. setting them up on some sort of a tombstone or multi-fixtured uh, work piece. It gets crazy. There's a customer of mine up in, um, in Carson City that did exactly that. They're doing a, a gearbox housing for a medical company in the Bay. And we've sold them four Eurotech machines, dual spindle, dual turret, live tool. There isn't one turn part on it. And they do it all out of bar stock complete rather than tabbing it on a vertical. And then some of the bigger stuff, I guess, now, nowadays you can use those automatic parts loaders, right? Which, oh, God, which, yeah. Which use the ro- so if you, So like the, what is it? The uh, the, bar three, feet. the three bore like oh. on, on, on like a lathe is like, you know, two and a half-ish mm-hmm. from like most lathes, right? Yep. So if anything bigger than that, you can't feed it through the bore. So now you need a robot to like load it for you, which you guys sell too, right? Exactly. And yeah. So, sells, yeah. Well, two things. We, Haas does, they're getting into robotics, which is, again, related back to the automation portion of... Garrett and I talked about this briefly before you guys came in as well. You know, it's hard to get people. So how do you get stuff done? How do you get parts out the door? You have to come up with some sort of automation. So Selway, and again, a Bill Selway, again, being just a total visionary. Honest to God, he I, I came up. This is, we're, I think, in year six of our automatic uh, robot loader, which is uh, what we call our AX series. But it's been so popular now in the Bay, you'll sell a five axis machine, which is a single pallet. So you have a single pallet with maybe a multi piece, you know, work holding um, uh, device on there. And instead, now you could put a robotic pallet loader attached to that machine 
with 30 pallets hmm. and let this thing just run overnight. You don't have any, you know, you have one guy set it up, load it up with material and you come back in the morning, you got nothing but parts. So it's become a enormous part of the, uh, of the industry here, automation, regardless of whether it's robotics or just multi-pallet systems, it's become yeah. very, very big lately. Hard to go wrong with it at that point. So it is. So pallets are for like, like essentially like a jig, right? You can like load it, like you just load, make, make a bunch of pallets and you have someone or something load the pallets in for you. You got it. A hundred percent. Someone or something. And in this sense, it's a robot that's mm-hmm. loading them. So right, sure. each of those 30 pallets could be a production part, right? We could just put whatever you want on those pallets or it could be 30 different jobs. Now, the question there is then you have to have a lot of tools to accommodate those 30 jobs. So yeah. that's somewhat times, you know, early on, you, we'd get to in front of people and Dan Selway was always good at this. You know, he'd say, you know, pallets and tools, you got to have them. They got it. They go together. And uh, they're right. You know, some people in the day back in the day, they'd sell a guy a horizontal and it have 60 tools on it. And in six months, he's going, wait a minute, I need. I need a hundred. I need one hundred and twenty tools. I need two hundred tools. I can't have all these jobs. I don't have enough tools in my machine to accommodate all those jobs. So that's where some of our products shine. Matt Sura, they make a three hundred and thirty tool machine wow. on their on their horizontals Damn, 30. and their yeah, yeah three hundred and thirty <laughs> tools on a, a, a like the Mam thirty five V has become a humongous success. It's been a they've been making five axis machines. Matt Sura has since nineteen eighty nine. So. They're so far ahead of the game in five axis. That is the next, um, you know, uh, what would you say, kind of technology that we see coming in full force these days. Five axis is huge. And they make a 32 pallet, 330 tool machine that, again, you could just put anything on and you're done. (laughs) Done. Put it on there. Same work holding. There's no change of fixture plates or two you got everything in the machine to make whatever you need to make it's it's amazing it's amazing there's a medical company up in reno that has bought 22 of them from me they, they have a humongous high mix i think they've got 7800 different part numbers but they do like low volume so it's like you know yeah. 1 to 25 and so gotcha. it's a perfect machine because you can literally go oh we need to fire up 10 of those and it's one piece work holding so you don't have to worry about changing anything in the machine the tools are all are they're all in the machine and of those 22 machines every tool from 1 to 330 is identical so they can put any part in any machine and run it at any time it's crazy that's cool that's yeah, so beautiful cool. beautiful facility I want to circle back. So you went to Chico State, right? Yes. So what did you graduate with? Because you said you kind of got like roped into this or it was like a good fit for you to work for Selway, right? It was. I left without graduating. Oh, I you did? I did. I was like, okay, I got a year left. Nope. I'm ready to go get a job. I would rather just go ahead and start making money. The yeah. wipe was done. So we're like, no, let's go. So we moved back down to the Bay Area and Six months later, I was working. So did you study business? I didn't. No. I, so I got, so my dad, uh, who is, you know, probably taught me the personality, the way to deal with people, had a small um, garden nursery center in Oakland. My great grandmother started this in the 30s. And uh, I worked there from the time I was six years old. I mean, I'd bring people up, Aww. count change, help people with you know, out in the, out, out on the nursery side. And I loved it. I love, again, dealing with people and just helping them out and walk through and then grab all their stuff, bring them up to the counter, ring them up. And I did that till I was in college. And it just was one of those things. I knew exactly dealing with people is what I wanted to do. And it just kind of led me in that direction. Gotcha. So, you yeah. just have like a knack for it. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. <laughs> and I was never, and I was really never a school guy. I never was. I just Same. was not in <laughs> school. You're looking at three, you're sitting okay. across yeah. the table from three college. I, that's <laughs> why we all understand each other. Well. Yeah. I swear I hated high school. I wasn't Same. a big fan of high school. I had super fun in high school, but yeah. uh, got out of high school and uh, and i think if it wasn't for me meeting my wife i mean who knows what the hell i'd be doing because i followed her to chico <laughs> uh, that's awesome yeah so garrett heard a rumor and we want to know if it's true yeah garrett go ahead and ask I, him i heard you used to box is that true 
I did? Yeah. No. no. Oh, someone said Who you used told to be you a that? boxer. Oh, someone that used to work, work for here, us. Yeah. Maybe oh, my... they were trying to just like make us scared of you. Mm, no, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think maybe uh, it goes back to, there was a few times in those younger days. Um, <laughs> you had to work out some deals. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, I, there was, they called it the Mike Tyson clothes. There was a guy down in, um, in San Jose. I'll never forget this. He bought a, bought the sh- a machine from me. And I was, I think, 25 at the time. And I'm, I'm calling him. And back then we didn't have cell phones, right? So I'm go, I'm at the office calling this guy, calling this guy, and he's not returning my phone call. So I go, okay, I'm going to go down and see this guy. Well, I found out he bought a foot all after he had just bought a machine for me. And I go, huh, really? <laughs> I thought we had a deal. And I, and I was pissed. And we, I was like going after the guy, not physically, but just like yelling. I'm like, what are you doing? I, you can't do that. And maybe that's what it's from. It went around the industry for a little bit. Like oh, yeah. he, he did the Mike Tyson clothes on. He still bought the Fidal. I lost, I lost the deal anyway. So I was going to burn in flames. I was just going to go down one, two, three. <laughs> but no, never boxed. I'm a huge boxing fan, but gotcha. never boxed. Okay, so it is a rumor. Good rumor, though. I yeah. like that one. I know. Because I, I've always wanted to, even in in uh, when I went up to uh, Chico, my buddy and I were going to take boxing, and we never mm. did, but we boxed each other instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that counts, right? Yeah, correct. We could throw that out there. Right on. So we want to ask, if in starting up a machine shop, what is one piece of equipment that you mm. recommend to your customers? I know that's like a difficult question because every you know application is different, but right. if you want to start out... In machining, what is a f- one or two or three foundational machines that you recommend that are for tried sure. and true and you're going to see a return? Yeah, for sure. I've got a number of good examples uh, and, and it in good call. It is always different. Um, in, in, in particular, um, Ken Montes at Phase 5 Tactical here in Roseville um, came to me and he says, Keith, I want to buy a machine from you. I want to look at a tool room mill. And after looking at his product... Uh, I said, Ken, you're going to hate me in six months if I sell you this tool room mill. I said, why don't you start with a VF series, which is the Haas VF1, and they will go ahead and uh, you will have better parts, better finish. It's more rigid, this, that, and the other. And and he listened to me, of course, and bought the VF1. Um, So a mill, entry-level mill is a great option uh, to start. Um, but sometimes those options can change. Another one in particular is this gentleman up in in, in Reading, really nice guy, um, and he did everything. He, very 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 smart guy. It almost made me feel dumb sometimes talking because it was <laughs> like Jerry, you are you got your that stuff together. To I feel like right? that's common in machining. machining sometimes yeah. we oh, meet them and they're God. so odd and they live like really odd lifestyles, but they're like prodigies. They are prodigies. Every guy that I've ever met, and and I mean not everyone, but God, you're right. 90 they're so smart yeah and i feel like it's like that movie beautiful mind where they're like writing yes, calculations yeah, on windows yeah, and yeah, like that. totally but then they like they're writing them on their machine instead yeah, and they like can't check their mail or something yeah, yeah. you know you can't have it all right exactly exactly <laughs> and so this guy was going down the path and started with a vertical mill and and we got to talk and in his mind just started going and he ended up buying a umc five axis for his first machine um but i would say again take the take the um Take the application out of it. Yeah. You know, to start with a mill and a lathe uh, is is huge, you know, and it doesn't matter what size. Of course, the size depends on the parts that you do. But a very good customer of mine, very, very good friend I've known for over 20 years uh, over in Rancho Cordova, had a huge shop in the Bay Area back in the day, 80 man shop. And uh, he got out of it and then came back into it. And the first two machines I sold him was a Haas VF2 SS which is their high-speed vertical mill, and then the uh, ST20 lathe. He bought both to start, and you kind of have to have both, right? Customers sending you parts, they're like, hey, you can do any round parts. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. I got a lathe. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, that's what, as we all know, lathe is for round. Mill is generally across the board for square and everything mm-hmm. else, but you can do round parts on a, on a mill if you really had to so mill lathe and then over always need a manual piece of equipment even still definitely, today definitely it's it's required you know if you want to go ahead and go take the time and program a part for a second op or something that you have to do to just drill a hole or mill a pocket or or, or mill an angle it's a pain in the butt otherwise you just go put on the ma- on the manual machine and do what you need to crank do crank it out right mm-hmm. then and there right crank it out right then and there and it's a great foundational base for for guys that have uh either got into the industry or are getting into the industry to understand manual machining 
to feel that cutter go through the material, hear it, see what kind of you know finish you get by raising the speeds, lowering the speeds, and 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 using it through different materials. Aluminum and brass and plastic are so easy, but then when you start to get into stainless and and different types of steels and then exotics like your your heavier uh, materials like inconels and hastaloys and monels it becomes crazy <laughs> and, and so, expensive i'm and sure expensive yeah. yes so all of the above so mill lathe to start of course and then having something as a support piece i would say i like that you call those metals exotic yeah <laughs> or, or like those yeah. Mater- or those materials or those materials yeah um so i think i already know the answer to this but do you have clients who are on a budget and want to start out. And I mean, similar to us, we were just getting into machining and learning it, but we have this incredible team of, you know, everybody kind of has this different skill so they can learn it. When someone just say it's a one man shop, they have maybe one or two of the skills they need. Do you have other businesses or clients or companies you recommend to come out and say program or totally yeah so you're able to so you're because i know for sure 100 percent, your goal is sustainability you're not trying to just sell someone something that you're like exactly like you're saying you need these two yeah you're looking for lifetime customers because you're not here to just you know wheel and deal so since your goal is sustainability you're able to full like fill the circle for them, right? Absolutely. 100%. And so how do you do that? So two things. Uh, so Selway Machine Tool has a phenomenal applications department. So uh, for many, many years in the Bay Area, we've always had, you know, two or three really key guys. And those key guys have been either machinists or applications for a long, long time. Same in the LA area. And then I just recently, last year, hired my first one up here. So Kevin Ferris, mm-hmm. Uh, who I've known for 20 years and I always this guy is an absolute rock star I mean he comes in there isn't anything I don't think I could trip the guy up he knows everything (laughs) there is about machining Um, and if he doesn't he's willing to dig in and, and learn what he needs to understand about that customer's part and application he's awesome but then beyond that, because like you said, there's a budget, there's a cost for that, right? Right. Selway has always had um, free classes. As long as you bought a Haas, we have our facility right here in Sacramento. We have training classes that we did once a quarter that you could send as many guys as you want, as many times as you want to do intermediate, you know, beginning, intermediate, and advanced programming. But with COVID, we can't do that. So over those years, having to have somebody that is really, on, like you said, a short budget or just needing help because they're getting going, um, I aligned myself with my customers. And believe it or not, um, I've had three guys over the years that have been awesome. And one in particular right now that's helping me out in Reno, just say, hey, Caleb, uh, this guy just bought a machine because right now we're seeing an influx of people that haven't been in the industry before yeah. coming into manufacturing. Because yeah. it's so big and it's so booming big. and it's crazy like not to, if, if that's what you're doing, it's crazy not to. It's kind of like what we're doing. Yeah. Bring yeah. it in. It just makes sense. Uh, Cut out the middleman if, if you can. If you're selling a product, you know, go full spectrum on it. Yeah. And to- it takes totally. a lot of time and planning and effort. But if you have someone like you on your team, which luckily we do, yeah, yeah. then you can help <laughs> us and provide the resources and help us map out that whole plan exactly yeah. and i always say this even if it's not through me you know i can i, I there's going to be a solution that you might find through somebody else yeah. but you know you can always and i tell people this all the time when i even talk to them for the first time because we get customers that call and they want to you know ask I said you have my number now call me anytime you want <laughs> i was telling garrett right now it's a little bit hard because it's so busy i yeah. feel like a ding dong that i can't get back to people <laughs> as quickly as i usually do um it's just the level of businesses is so crazy but um that is a good call and and you you have to have the ability to it not always be selling right but be helping customers figure out what they want it's or what like, they need it's been like that with a lot of uh people lately actually been dealing with it's like some people can take a call right now and some people are just it's text and email only yeah yeah because yeah. mm-hmm. yeah. they're just so yeah. backed up they can't even try to stay yeah, yeah zach heard a statistic on the radio this morning what was that Oh, that uh, auto automobile sales and automotive products are actually what help push uh, manufacturing gains for the fourth quarter. Hundred percent, which is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> feel yeah. pretty proud it's to be part of that a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah that's no, cool. agreed, agreed. But to to answer your question or to wrap that one up, um, you know, when you have the ability to have those people that can help you support your customers, and then they love to do it, being that there's so many new people coming in. Um, there's a gentleman, a good friend of mine, again, known him for 20 years up there in Reno, and he is literally 
being pulled in all directions because these guys, once you get somebody that's very knowledgeable that can help out on that level, they're like, oh my God. They all want to use you. They all want, yes, exactly. exactly. Put you on speed dial. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it's fun to do that, right? You, you're helping them get uh, past that point. Like Mallory said, right now with the level of business, lead times are way out, prices are way up, and quality yeah. is a little, you know, compared to who you use, you know, could be suspect. So that's why when I see these trends in, it, in industry like it is now, it's always the OEMs, the manufacturers that are bringing, you know, machining in house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just can't live with the lead times, basically, mm -hmm. and the prices that have risen. I think it's awesome that you're able to build that trust and keep those customers coming back because if you help them build that foundation, there's no reason why they can't. Your Completely your goal agree. is if you grow, we grow. Yes, right. Hundred percent. It's, it's a mutual relationship. Yeah, it's true, and and you're right. And some of the times you'll see, you know, in in a deal, and you're maybe competing against somebody else, and you know, the guy's like, oh, he hasn't even got me a quote yet. And here we yeah. are ready to sign your mm -hmm. deal. You know, so it's the response too that you get from the customer that, you know, you're, you you got to try to be on it as quick as you can and turn those things for them around because things move so fast these yeah. days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Service is That's, everything, you know. It I'm is. A, I'm a big sucker for service. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. me too. Everyone always says don't sell on service, mm -hmm. you know, but you need service. Machine tools especially, they're made, they're going to break. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know of plenty of brands X, Y, and Z that you'll call up and they're like, oh, well, we'll put you in the queue if you give us a PO and you need to give them a PO before they come out and service your machine. And you're like, wait a minute, I am down. I am losing money. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have nine service guys in the Sacramento region, which, you know, thank God I came up here with just me in 2001. And now we've got a uh, tooling sales guy and nine nine service guys for this region and it's grown to help our customer base it's it and you have to have it you yeah. have to that's no, I awesome agree. yeah yep. service is, is key. key i mean that's what rough stuff was like founded on yep that's yep. so why you guys are successful yeah. you've got to take care of your customers support them for your sales and service do you do are you it's all encompassing to you or do you have like an assistant to help you answer mm. calls or answer emails or is there anyone that can pick up anything for you? Now I do. Yes. Oh, good. For so many years, it was me doing a lot of that on my I'm own. I'm sure but your was... wife was like, get off the phone. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> yes, exactly. But you know, two things, it is good to have that, be, you know, that, um, what's the word just to have that under you. So if you, you, you have an assistant, you still can do it. You know, you don't right. have to worry about relying on them a hundred percent. Uh, but Johanna Landry, she's a sweetheart of mine. Just hired her two years ago. She is my assistant. She actually was local, came in fifth of five interviews, and she was nervous as heck. And I'm mm. like, oh, my God. She is the one, though. Her personality is awesome. Um, and she takes care of everything. I literally now take an order. She does everything from here on out. She's yeah. in Lafayette, Louisiana. Right. Now we're just a suburb of Lafayette. Kind of working remotely, which we thought we need to offer the job because she's so good. But now everybody's remote. Yeah. 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 That was a good uh, fourth yeah. thing. It curve. was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were ahead of the curve. Exactly. That actually yeah. happened to us, too. We had, a, we had an employee before COVID uh, move back to Idaho. Okay. And we're like, okay, how can we make this work? And he does our, our CAD design for us. Sure. And so when COVID hit, we, had, we were already set up to do meetings over, you know, uh, we actually use Google meet instead of zoom but essentially you know, essentially zoom meetings sure so it was like kind of like no factor it was just all right yeah. cool just more computers yeah easy transition mm -hmm. actually you know. yeah i think everybody just more faces out. on the screen yeah. exactly much. Yeah. you got it exactly and i think you know i mean we were talking there's some good things that have come out of this valerie and i were saying i'm not a big zoom person it takes up too much of my day i'd rather be in front of a customer but it is a easier way to get things done and interact and make sure everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. totally. And pajamas yeah. from the waist down. Yeah, correct. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So since you've been in this industry for 28 years and you've, I'm sure, sold thousands and thousands of machines, we want to know what have you seen people do wrong and what have you seen people do mm, right? Yeah. Because I'm sure you've question. seen a lot of seen it. seen a ton of it. And you're right. I mean... Uh, of the amount of machines over the years and it and it and it and it really was maybe this word what i'm going to say is probably more local to the bay area i don't see it as much up here but a lot of people when they get into the manufacturing industry and oh my god uh i've had customers that in the first you know year two years they're buying 10 15 machines yikes you can't and even learn that you can't even get electrical for that many years yeah, no you're right i mean they've moved maybe once or twice they yeah. bought so much equipment and they and for not for a very good reason they're busy 
but they would, as busy as they are and the money that they created through that business, they weren't paying off their equipment. Mm -hmm. So as they continue to become successful and create a amazing foundation of base customers, they kept adding without subtracting Probably the, the losing payments. quality control too. Just a lot too of many that. plates spinning in the too air. Too many plates spinning in the air. And then what trips them up? And this is this manufacturing 101. We are a cyclical industry, right? We are on a run right now that we've never seen. These last four years oh, really? have been insane. And we could kind of discuss a little bit of the numbers. But uh, if somebody doesn't, if they all of a sudden have 15 machine payments, and we hit a little downturn. Yeah. How can they sustain when they got forty thousand dollars a month in machine? Payments? We think yeah. about that every time we want to purchase something new. Good for you, you know, you, we yeah. think about baby steps. Yeah, we baby steps. But we also <laughs> think about how to pivot. And I think COVID is a great example of how to pivot. One example. It's off topic, but. Uh, Garrett had heard about a woman who owned a gym and when gyms closed in March, she uh, rented out her equipment. So you could Mm. come pick up like an exercise bike. You could come pick up a couple sets of weights and things like that. And that is a great way to pivot. So whenever we purchase something, we think about if the bottom falls out, that's what we always say. If the bottom falls out, yes. how can we, what else can we make? And so Garrett will actually look into that and we'll talk to our team yep. and see how we can pivot. So how flexible I, can this piece yeah. of equipment really be for us? And in how much freak are these payments costing us yes. a month? And yeah. how much does it cost to keep the lights on and yes. whatever? All yeah. the above. And that's, I think, of my years and seeing people, you know, uh, you're going to make mistakes every now and then, you of know, course. I guess that'd be more on my shoulders uh, if you bought the wrong machine. But we've right. had people, you know, one of the funny things is people always say, right, you can do small mach- parts on a big machine, but you can't do big parts on a small machine. Yeah. So it's always kind of that. What size do I need? The minute you buy a 30 inch machine, a 34 inch part comes through the door. The minute you yeah. buy a 40 inch machine, a 50 inch part comes through the door. Yeah. So there's always that. But the biggest one that I've seen in all my years is exactly that is just not taking care of the payments and keeping them under control because you know you're going to hit a downturn at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. That's actually kind of what I was thinking about when Mallory asked you what machine or machines you know you would recommend buying yeah why you said a lathe and a mill because i was thinking like maybe a lathe with live tooling and yeah then, and then once you start talking through a little bit more or just said what you said i was like yeah that makes sense because you, you need to be able to have the capabilities of doing a bigger part if that job comes through the door versus having the yeah no you're you're a hundred percent right if you look at most of lathes with live tooling yeah you're limited you're limited to the through hole and the swing of the of the, of the capacity of the lathe what mm-hmm. it can turn and in a mill, you could always get around it. You could shift it. You could move it down. You could, you know, if you got a long part on a 40 inch table, the windows open up. You could shift it down, move it to do ops two and three if needed. Uh, if it was, you know, a, a large, large part, but a lathe, you're stuck there and you're not fitting yeah. it in that envelope. It ain't going in. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. 100%. What have people done right that you've seen? Other than us, we're yeah. obviously near perfect. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's another great question. I think a number of good answers over all these years has been um, don't rely on one industry, right? Mm. So if you look at the amount of people that diversify and they say, okay, hey, uh, I've got a uh, customer, and he might be in aerospace, um, and I've got another customer, it might be in medical. Well, let's just say, You know, aerospace, like what has happened with Boeing and COVID, right? Everything Boeing was producing, I think they were up to 48 planes, 48 737s a month. Oh, my god! And I think they're down to 15. Mm. So all that work, and don't quote me on those numbers, just industry in my head kind of thinking about, I think that's where they're at. But I think overall, uh, being diverse, you know, because if aerospace dries up and you've only got medical left, well, what else is there? I got medical. Well, elective surgeries dried up. So a lot Mm -hmm. of the elective surgeries and my customers that were building machines, um, Da Vinci robots for elective surgery uh, with high end medical companies that dried up. So now what are you left with? Well, you got firearms, you got semiconductor, you got (laughs) yeah, you got firearms. Yes, you've got (laughs) so much more that's out there. So. I'd say the biggest thing, and, and it's funny you're you're mentioning this because a very good customer of mine up in Reno who makes wheel adapters, he just bought his first kind of big machine, a, a nice uh, sized horizontal. And um, his whole thing was I want to be diverse enough because as much as I'm doing in wheel adapters, I want a job shop. I want to start mm-hmm. getting some other business in here. And that's probably the biggest uh, thing you could do in terms of 
having diversity in, in, in your, in the work that you take in. That's yeah. how you support your family in a crash. Totally. Speaking of which, since you've been through some ups and downs, how was 2008, 2009? What was mm. the economic, I don't forget what we call it, like the economic crash. Yeah. The recession. The yeah. recession. Oh. What was that like for you and how did it affect you guys? How did it affect your customers? Yeah, it was that. Okay. So, uh, over the amount of years I've been doing this, three good downturns, two big ones. And September 11th was the biggest mm. uh, that I had seen because we were coming off the dot-com boom in 99, yeah. 2000. <laughs> it's going to sound funny, but we were taking orders off the fax machine like you wouldn't <laughs> believe. That thing was nonstop burning. We do the same thing here. Yeah, it was it was crazy, um, the amount. And, 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 and that was nuts. And then September 11th hit and 02 was very very bad uh you saw mm-hmm. industry uh collapse in manufacturing i think we went from um and i say this as we talked about uh, maybe n- maybe not saying too much but numbers we were down from oh uh 2000 to 01 70 percent wow Whoa. yeah damn yeah. and that's a huge huge number when you're you know oh a gosh. fairly yeah. decent sized company so September 11th was bad following that. And then the recession, 08, was actually a very good year. It was 9 and 10 uh, were extremely bad. Right. And that's where we saw another big crash, 9 and 10, uh, again, down in that 70% range. But this was the first time we saw people leave the industry. Hmm. Our customer database was reduced by about 30%. Gosh. Wow. Just saying, I'm done. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's Just closing gnarly. up. Closing and up. Ha- that must feel horrible for you being so close to your customers horrible. and things like that. That must have been really hard on you. Yeah. You get to that point, right? You create such great relationships where, you know, you see these people and I tell my wife this all the time, you know, you get to that point where the first 45 minutes, it seems like you're in there. You're not even talking business. How you doing? What's happening? You know, kind of like you, you and I, when yeah. I first came in, how the kid, how's your little daughter doing? It's funny. You, you, you can create these relationships and they become friendships yeah. and then over time yeah if something happens to that company you're like oh man um so it is rough and and auctions are a part of the industry you're gonna see them happen but um those were the two biggest downturns and you know frankly i i, I see i don't see it happening here you know in in the near future but yeah. we, we don't know where the next you know couple of years are gonna be i was gonna yeah. ask do you guys do buybacks or do you have uh like local companies yeah, yeah good call well, we, we don't do we broker it mm-hmm. so if like a customer's looking to upgrade a machine they're trying to get out of a machine and into something else we will broker the machine out for them so meaning a customer that uh or a used uh dealer that i will work with and again, it's funny, after 27 years, 28 years of doing this, I have one good finance guy, I've got one good used guy, and I got one good tooling yeah. guy. You know, of these guys That's that are out team. there, there's so many of them. You're right, but it's the people that do business like you do business. You take care of the customer, you're prompt in response, this, that, and the other. So we'll call up one of my used guys and I'll say, hey, George, I've got a, you know, an 08 VF2 SS I got to get rid of because guy wants a new one. And he'll give me a number. That number will go direct to the customer and then boom, they get the new machine and that machine comes out the day the new one comes in. So nice. it's just upgrading, keeping on top of technology. Do you think that part of your recent growth, because you said I think the last four years are bigger than you've ever seen. Yes. Do you think that part of that is due to the tariffs? Because that has the, the idea, right, was to bring manufacturing into the U.S. For sure. Yeah. So, so that is, that's what you attribute most of it to? I do. You know, again, if you go back to the early days of the dot-com boom and we saw a a lot of semiconductor, uh, it, it, not exclusively, but a lot of work go offshore. You know, China, India, Vietnam, smaller places with le- cheaper labor mm-hmm. right. got a lot of that business that we lost. Yeah. And then again, the recession hit uh, and it was even worse. And we saw so much being done outside of our, right? Because if you remember, we were saying, oh, we, we, we could be, you know, software, look at software is going through the roof and, and, and computers and everything is great. Well, no, we found out after the recession, we still need to build things. Okay. And that's what this company or this country was, was formed by is building, uh, right. you know, building things. And so I think when we, when we saw 08 and 09 were so bad, uh, the the outcome from those two years, I will never forget this. We have IMTS, which is the big uh, machine tool show in Chicago, every two years. So it was an IMTS year, IMTS year in uh, in 2010, and it had been a terrible year in 2010. You know, nine and ten, you're like, geez, this is just rough. And uh, 
September hit in uh, 2010, and that fourth quarter was amazing. It was like, okay, we're back. But we came back so strong because we were down so so far. Mm. But then now we've seen these last four years, as you mentioned, uh, I, I've never seen anything like it. In my 27 years, these going on 28, th- these last four have been um, insane. I mean, yeah. the material, the parts, the amount of reshoring, the amount of business, like you said, that's come back to America. Yeah. Holy smokes, uh, every shop. So 90% of who I call on are standard mom and pop job shops. The other 10% are OEMs, manufacturers. And so all these mom and pop shops that are subcontracting through others or maybe even t- second and third tier are slammed. Good. That's and great I mean, to hear, man. Slam. It's yeah. great for yes. uh, people to have jobs and yes. it makes you proud to be an American. Well, yeah. it is. And it also is one of those things that, that going back to the schools, you see these younger kids mm-hmm. now being introduced to CNC That's equipment. That's totally true. They go oh, hand in hand. Yes. I didn't even think about yes. that. It's like full circle. So that's yeah. the grace. That's the silver lining. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's when we see guys asking about, um, you know, hey, Keith, I, yeah, I'd buy a machine from you, but I don't have anybody to run yeah. it. There was a kid, uh, Tanner, at Rockland High School. I said, keep my number. Just call me if you need something. <laughs> yeah. And he did. He called. He's like, yeah, I finished and Aww. I'm looking for a job. And so interestingly enough, um, one of my good customers, uh, Vic up at Stellar View Microscopes in Auburn, he's like, he called me two days after Tanner gave me that call. And he's like, Keith, I'm looking for somebody. And Thanks. they love him. So he's up there, you know, helping Aww. out with their That's shop. Perfect. So you're getting that next gen of kids that are introduced to this now uh, that will help create that next you know, a uh, wave of, of machinists. Yeah. yeah. That's really exciting. That's and if it's not taught through school or through on the job, I mean, where does it go? It kind of leaves the country, right? And you got it. Knowledge disappears and we have to gain it back somehow. That's a great call. The knowledge disappears that, that tribal knowledge of, of understanding uh, what we do and how to build. Yeah. It's yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of like the dot com boom really pushed a lot of people away from wanting to learn trades. Yeah. Totally. And oh, kind of totally. pick up these yeah. skills that, you know, like they're said, kind of built mm-hmm. America and, you know, yeah. And yeah. Zach, that's it's, a it's great cool call. to see it back. Yeah. Because, you know, for a long time, it's everybody just wanted to online, get quick, rich scheme, you know, mm-hmm. cash yeah. in, sell out, and be They're done. They're still retired. Like YouTube. Yeah, it's totally. I'm yeah. an Instagram influencer when I grow but up. My niece like, want to sure. be a YouTuber. <laughs> yeah. She's 11. Sure. I'm like, honey, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. You got to learn how to make something. You learn how to run CNC mills. Well, that's, yeah. a, I'm telling you, it is, uh, it, it's funny because it was, I got in 94, it was a dirty word. It was machining. It was, you know, job shop. And you walk in and you walk out with chips all over your shoes yeah. And, yeah. and oil and grease. Greasy dudes in coveralls. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And, and now today it's almost more of a glorified position. It's so neat. It's Even so like welders, awesome. people, our customers mm-hmm. like grovel for our welders. Like they, welders their work, are amazing. They are. Their work oh, is absolutely. great. Welding is hot, you guys. <laughs> no, it, 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 welding is, and I've seen a lot of, well, right, because we go machining and fab go hand in hand. Uh, but your guys' welds are, I remember walking through this. They're beautiful. Yeah, they're great. You guys have talented people out there. I agree. We're very fortunate to have a great team, that's for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it. One thing I was thinking back when I used to work for Garrett's mom, Carol, at Sierra College, and we were working on um, manufacturing and helping schools. I remember specifically she would get a, right, she would write grants to the state of California and if, mm-hmm. uh, write for them, and if she got approved. So she had to spend all all of it yes. and every penny. Yes. And I remember the end of the year scramble and the reason they want you to do that. And that's how these schools are getting these machines, right? Yes. You're saying some schools have eight machines, 16 machines. Yes. They're able to do that because if you don't spend it all, then the state thinks you didn't need it. Yep. And the next year they won't write you for more. hundred percent. And so I remember at the end of the year, Carol kind of scrambling to be like, what do you need? What do you need? What do you, it's like yep. a Santa, you yeah. know what I mean? And so <laughs> I think that's part of when we're saying we're educating Schools are educating students and people to get back into manufacturing, and totally. that's where that money's come from, and that's why it's so important to oh, be totally. able to provide those resources. And you're right, and and you know who would have ever thought California and the money they're putting towards these programs would come from the state? But yeah, uh, I guess it's one of the good things because they have they have <laughs> yeah. put a yeah. ton yeah. of money towards the career technical education programs and those have in turn there's a number of different fields they can take right you can go from culinary to law enforcement to manufacturing and whatever the schools feel like is best for them and their students but so many of them have jumped on the uh manufacturing side mm-hmm. it's just it, it is so um and and the teachers are great too the yeah. instructors 
you know, they're the ones that have to make the kids inspired, but they have the resources to do it. They have the money. They, you know, all these teachers are using, you know, Fusion 360 as their go-to for all their CAM software. Mm -hmm. And then when you see 30 seats, because Fusion's given to the schools now wow. on, yeah. on uh, in these classrooms and they got computers and they got CNCs and they got printers and all this stuff. And you're like, like you said, Zach said it earlier, you know, where was this when I was in school? It yeah. was all leaving when I left high school, yeah. but it is back in full force. Yeah. It's awesome. Great. And was, you're right. It has to be spent or they will not get any more yeah. money. Yeah. I was actually going to ask you, that was one of my next questions. Yeah. Um, for CAD or CAM software, is it mostly Fusion 360? What are you are you seeing people pull you, back from other things? Yeah. No, 100%. And great question. You, you, you know, if you went back... Well, go back 20 years. Uh, Master Cam, GeoPath was where AutoCAD, right? That yeah, was Yeah, I remember where it in high school at Dolaro, it was AutoCAD. AutoCAD. And we had it in like Frosh Tech. That's yeah. where we were taking it. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, AutoCAD rolled into, you know, some other good, uh, you know, Master Cam was a big one. Or yeah. It still is. Uh, G, um, Surf Cam, uh, CamWorks, uh, Dell Cam, Feature Cam. There's so many of them. But Fusion has been acquiring, and uh, I have a very good friend that um, uh, had a great job here locally and loved Fusion so much, went to work for Autodesk. Mm. And uh, he told me, this was a few months back, he's like, Keith, there will be no reason for anybody to buy anything other than Fusion 360 because of all the tool paths they're incorporating from others that they are acquiring. And it is. It is a has been a game changer because they've changed what it used to be. The cost to get into CAD cams were so extensively right. so expensive. Thousands and thousands and thousands. And they're going up numbers. every year yeah. too. Yeah. Every year it's like you your maintenance like every year. Thirty thousand yeah. or something yes. crazy, huh? Yes. And now with Fusion, your entry point is almost minimal. That's. Can, do you think that attributes to the growth then in manufacturing? I believe oh, so. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. now you're making it more attainable for everybody. Oh, absolutely. And you could sit home and just if you wanted to get a free trial, I think and, they give you a free trial yeah. for like a six months or something. So you could yeah. just doodle and kind of learn it as you go that's great that's a great call i think you're 100 yeah. right it's definitely led to it my friend works for autodesk doing hr isn't that what she oh, said no yeah she does hr she said she loves it she's like i can't believe i got in with this company i great mean she does company. hr so it doesn't yeah. have as much to do with their goal but she uh well it does but she um just said it's an amazing company yeah. and she feels super grateful so. yeah they are they have they really, you know, it's funny. You've 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 got people that have come into this industry where you think it can't be really changed because it's, yeah. you know, it is what it is. It's manufacturing, it's done a certain way, but uh, Autodesk has flipped the software side on its head. Do you yeah. have some customers who were sort of like old timers and now the you know the software is changing no. do they roll with that or no. is it like, <laughs> you know I, well they keep they try well they do so right when if you didn't use cad cam and and back when i started nobody did i mean it, again it was autocad yeah and uh but you still had to write the programs right yeah. autocad allowed you to draw um, you still had had nothing to put into the machine to read that what you drew, so you'd have to basically hand type all the all the lines of code in. That's crazy. Um, and there are people though you would they can, want to still do that, and they could do it faster than drawing yeah. up a program. Wow. It's insane. You've been doing it for decades. Decades. So yeah. some of those older guys, yes, uh, they. Um, I think they push back enough where, hey, I could do this and I don't need to. And then some do jump on board knowing that there is no other way. We got to go this Does way. Does that it's, not mm, matter mm. on the machine you're getting? You can just write it any way you want. It will take the information in any way. Or are there points where it's like, okay, you better switch. Like, get on the bus and sleep yeah. without you. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, well, today, it really is everything is CAD. You, yeah. you gotcha. know, it's yeah. 99% of the people are using CAD CAM software. Um, and it's gotten so good and has Actually, that's the uh, another big reason why the industry has grown by leaps and bounds is because you can take a model and you could draw a model and dump it right into a machine and, it out you, you know, you've got the code per that model. It's just so insane. We just got back from Chicago. We were at uh, the Bistronic facility. Yeah. Okay. And they have that's this stronger. robotic arm that feeds the press brick for you. It okay. You know, it replaces the human for just doing a couple bends. Yep. But the programming was insanely easy. There's no code. It's so simple. It's zero code. You, it actually shows like different snapshots of the robot. It shows your part, like where, it sh where it's going to pick it up, where it squares it. And then where it, um, where every, every drop off point, yeah. every touch point, it, it, 
so you actually don't uh, you, you click and drag the robot close to the part. Yes. That's how you program it. Yes. And there's <laughs> literally yeah, like an easy button. Yeah. Yes. If there's yeah. a collision point, yeah. it just says fix and yeah. you hit the button yes. and, and it fixes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I crazy. asked him like, why would you want to do that? Cause you can either fix it automatically like Zach said, or you can do it uh, manually. I said, why, why would you want to do it manually? And he's like, well, you don't really need to, but if you're doing like 10,000 parts, it makes sense because you can save a second. Yeah. You actually have one second off this one. <laughs> it's 10,000 seconds. Faster. Yeah, it's so, a lot. Yeah. So it was cr- like, that's where I, I just getting a glimpse of that oh, in robotics. It was like, insane. It was so like, it, it's, it's it, incredible for a person like me who doesn't know like the you know programming. Yeah, um, it makes it I'm like okay, yeah, that's the that's the one I want. I don't want the one I have to hire someone to know how to program that. Yeah, one. like anyone can program this. Yeah. He said it's like a day of training. Yeah, like half mm. day or something. And that's wow. what's crazy. Yeah. Back when robotics, you know, were well, I shouldn't say were introduced. Just in my early days, um, I remember the Fnuc robot guys uh, was out of Colorado. I want to say. no, he was out of LA, but he said. East of Colorado, I think there was like 9,000 robots sold in one year. And west of Colorado, it was like 900. There was nothing except, you said, take LA out of that. But the robotics these days, because you had to have a guy that knew what he was doing back Mm -hmm. then. And you bought the robot, you bought caging, you bought end of arm work holding, you had so many things. And then the programming was a nightmare today with collaborative robots where you teach them and you touch them and they stop, right? So you don't have to have caging anymore. You yeah. literally bump into it and it will stop. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I asked you about that when you went to Buy Strong. I was like, could it just turn around and whip you, to, <laughs> like smack you in the back? And he well, was the, like, I don't know. Because well, it, it was inside of a, it's inside of you a gotta unit. lock it yeah. out and say you're not in so there. So disconcerting walking in there. Cause I we, bet. We, we walked into a, they have a, they just partnered with Oh, they brought with, you um, in the cage? Yeah, oh, we, yeah, we actually went into a bigger cage with uh, with another brand they just teamed up with called uh, Cluse. It's like a robotic welding cell. Ooh. And it's a big, it's one of the big arms. And we walked inside there and we're just, we're all like, like everybody's six watching their back. Right yeah. yeah. And then we're like, I don't know, is this safe? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start so just edgy. going to town, whipping around. Yeah. yeah. It's going to rip exactly. me apart like a freaking bear or something. Which well, it yeah. would. They had that, uh, that sorting <laughs> arm. I mean, that thing uh, was, what, nine feet tall or so? Oh, my gosh. The, Just where, like a pick and place? Yeah. So it was for pretty much, uh, I mean, it was like the whole nine yards. That it'll move pallets around. It'll take oh, pallets from yeah, laser yeah. over to the other robotic arm that then bends it. And it was just like, oh, that was a big thing. one for bending like a full sheet, like eight foot sheets of, yeah. you know, quarter, three eighths material if you wanted. It was huge. I've never seen one. I mean, it was yeah. huge, man. That, and well, and you guys, what well, you talked about it briefly, but IMTS never have been. Well, mm-hmm. and you're, again, maybe because of COVID, there was supposed to be one last year. Um, or no, sorry, we're in 2020 this year, and so we'll miss it this year, and it'll it'll be back in 22. But that is one of the things you'll see a Fnuc robot just putting a car chassis around in the air like it's a feather, oh, you know. My and, it's, and it's and it's and it's <laughs> the robotics that you'll see there, and the automation that you'll see there. You you gotta go if you haven't been. It is an amazing, amazing uh, show for manufacturing. Where yes, is that absolutely. at? And, and it's on the best place in the earth. It's in Chicago. Oh, I mean, I love Chicago. It's IMTS? Yeah. Yeah, I had written it down earlier. International Machine Tool yeah, Show. Well, well lo- let us know your dates. We'll travel with you. A hundred percent. Exactly. Class, we have a good right? time when we go. We, we take customers to the Cubs games and get some dinners in. And, of course, you know, the, the equipment and the and the stuff that's out there, you guys, it's jaw-dropping. It's jaw-dropping. So there, IMTS is about... Uh, four buildings and they're about I'm gonna say 200 to 300 thousand square feet apiece and they have software they have tooling and the tooling is amazing um, and then I got the opportunity this was I think it was three years ago I got to go to Germany and go to the emo show oh wow mm. so there is 26 buildings that are that size oh in Germany. Gosh. Where they, in Germany uh, is that? This one was in Hamburg. So they okay. go Hamburg, Hamburg, Milan. Hamburg, Hamburg, Milan. So every, uh, I think it's so every four years it's in Milan. What was that called? And that's Emo. Emo. Yeah. yeah. Garrett wants to write all these EMO. down. And uh, it is, <laughs> you want to talk about uh, getting to write off of a trip too, because right, you're going for business. So that's a, that's a write off for you, but it is insane. The amount of equipment. Now this is like equipment they use for like ship building, right? So you'll see bridge yeah. mills and, and horizontal boring mills that you got to get a ladder to get to the spindle. It's crazy. No way. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. So fun. Change the consumables of the forklift. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So on your website, we saw you guys have like little like customer quotes and customer yeah. comments, and one of them was more machines or more pallets. 
Ooh, that's a so here's the here's the here that's a great one. And I would say more pallets, right? Cuz you have more machines, you got to have more people. And that's where more pallets equal less people, more automation. Mm-hmm. And so I think the hardest thing and that's where the customer kind of crosses that threshold of going from I can't find any more people, I've got to get to a point where I can automate. And if I can't find the people, I could still do the amount of work but if I don't auto- add automation, then you know I'm I'm just I'm just spinning my wheels. That's yeah. funny. I actually, I, I when I read that question, I, I was interpreting it as like more pallets of parts, not more pallets That's of what like um, I thought too. Yeah, yeah. More pallets of like pallet loading. Yeah, yeah. we thought it meant like more stuff from vendors, like the middleman. Oh, like, okay, right? yeah. That's kind of like, where we fell. Like higher <laughs> yeah. inventory costs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or more machines. I'm like more machines. Yeah, it's like we, right. Because we had that with with when you start carrying a certain amount of inventory, you. It, the lead times get longer. You have to carry more. You still yep. have to get more warehousing. Yep. And versus it's so just, hard, you know, so far in advance to get something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the quality can fluctuate. Totally. Uh, yeah. Well, totally from, agree. And, yeah. Information is slower with vendors and all that stuff. So. Yeah. And that's where the pallet comes back into what we talked about early on, right? How many jobs can I fit on how many pallets? And when you start to think about how many pallets you can incorporate into one spindle, mm-hmm. that's when you try to get that spindle utilization rate up. Because the spindle utilization rate for a standard vertical in a shop, it's like 28% an eight-hour shift. Because you got setup, you got breaks, yeah. and a lot of time goes into setup. Well, once that machine is set up, like the guys I was telling you about up in Reno, they are running those Matsuras at 98% efficiency in spindle Whoa. utilization. So 24-7. So the amount of parts that they're generating, I think they said they did three and a half million parts last year. Oh, wow. Yeah, machine. On. That is insanity. It's yeah, we insanity. need, we need they're to just... run a night crew. Garrett was out here <laughs> yeah. last night as our night crew. Yeah. And, and that's a great call. You, the, the better than more machines is getting a second and third shift. You know, yeah. That's always the, 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 the solution. If you can't afford the machines, we'll then start another Put our shift. daughter to bed and went yeah. back yeah. to work last night. That's what he did. That. I'm waiting for that bar feeder. I had to load it. Yeah. Oh, tell night. me yeah. about it. Tell me about it. <laughs> Gosh darn it. So I didn't actually write them down, but I I don't know if you remember, but I know Garrett and Zach can fill in. What machines have we gotten from you? Mm. Yeah. Uh, ST20, ST15, and the recent one via 4 SS. Yeah. Yeah, No, and... uh, and, and new one, new feeder coming too. Oh, and and then new yeah. feeder on each of the lathes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you went with the edge on the mm-hmm. on the twenty, mm-hmm. um, which is a great bar feeder, by the way. And I I talked to the gentleman selling a, a really really nice guy, and we know edge very well. They're they're a leader on the on that side of it. Um, but right, that's one of those things. Instead of feeding the machine, get something to do it for you. You yeah. know, uh, I remember one of the first times I sold. A guy up in Incline Village, and this was early on in my career, but he bought a bar feed for a lathe. I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't sell any bar feeds. He's like, it's like an ATM machine because you just load it up and it's dropping parts all day. That's parts are money. Yeah, so he was happy as hell. That's to hear. Yes, it's true. It will be a huge benefit. Just again, if even if it's stuff you guys... You know, do some a lot of steel. So when you start to get into, you know, okay, aluminum's easy. Just let that go. But if it's, you know, maybe harder materials, put it at even fifty percent. You're laying on your pillow and that thing's rolling. <laughs> Just don't let anything break, and then you're yeah, okay. You're no to tools go. or anything else. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We went with the edge because the. Uh, because it's twelve foot, twelve foot bar, and that's what we need to eliminate yeah. all those drops. Yeah, yes. like all those stainless. That stainless is expensive. Yep. Yes, each time we we're each drop was like three or four bucks. Is at least yeah. yeah. And we have a fifty-five gallon drum full of that. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> You're you know God. twenty-four or thirty feet a day. It yeah. adds up pretty quick. That yeah. adds up very quick. And yeah. the uh, residual is not you know the, what they give you back on those drops is nothing. It no. used to be pretty good money from the recyclers, but mm-hmm. not so much anymore. No. Mm-hmm. Um, so what top brands do you carry? What are some of your top brands? I know obviously Haas. <laughs> yeah, Haas, you know, covers the majority of our market share, if you will. Uh, they've been a amazing leader and, and um, uh, they've grown so much, right? They started with uh just the vf1 and if you don't know that story uh gene haas you know went through a number of of iterations they started with rotary products in 1983 he was building rotary products for uh, a number of uh competitors and uh went through a number of this is part of what you would get bob murray one of my favorite people on the planet uh with haas automation he's uh, like gene's right arm um he tells the story about how this all, you know, the entrepreneurial days, the building days, the 
days of success that they go as they as they continue to add more to their to their product but you know those early days they were trying everything from you know electric cars you know to uh they had this they they had this contraption that they said would would be in every mall you'd get inside of it and it'd spin you around and it'd turn you upside down like a wa- like you were in a washing machine but it had a video player in front of it, it was like a roller coaster and it's like we'll put one of these in every mall <laughs> and uh and they, these, this, these these were things gene and, and them did they built actually and uh, he even says he says i think the electric car is somewhere in the back <laughs> but uh, they, one day they were in the shop on a weekend, as Gene did a lot, uh, repairing uh, a machine. And he's kind of looking and took a step step back and looked at it. He's like, casting, guideway, spindle. He's like, we can make one of these. And it was January of 88. And IMTS was September of 88. And he came in that following Monday. He goes, we're going to build machine tools. And we're going to take this to IMTS. So they did in nine months... They built the VF1, which was Holy the very God. first In one. Nine VF1. Months. <laughs> yeah, so that's where VF1 came from, the very first one. Jeez. Yeah. And here and they, and they sold, I believe it was the number, if I remember, uh, remember it was 54 machines they sold. They wanted the price. Because if you bought a Matsura at that time or a Mori, or, well, Mori wasn't even uh, making mills at that point, but uh, if you bought brands XYZ, um, you were spending a hundred and you know ten, one hundred and twenty grand on a vertical mill that was twenty by sixteen by twenty. Uh, Gene wanted to come out with a vertical mill under fifty grand, so they brought it to IMTS at forty nine nine ninety wow. and sold fifty four of them. That's a huge difference. Yes. My, yes. How big wow. was that company then? Because I mean, that's a that's a huge undertaking for nine yeah. months. I mean, they must have had a good that's financial backing. That's a huge initial too. order too. Fifty four right out of the gate. I mean, fifty four right, and and then the and and to answer your question, Garrett, uh, I, they were doing very well. And again, the numbers will escape me, but in the rotary product alone, I think they were doing about eight to ten million a year back in the eight. So they were selling a lot of product, coming up with a lot of different designs on their rotary. The very first one was the uh, HA5C, which was a 5C um, collet indexer, and and Gene put a little stepper motor on it. So they'd buy the 5C collets, add the stepper motor, and you now had a CNC machine or CNC um, indexer. They had a little servo motor box that ran it, and people loved it. Right, it reduced operations, reduced setups of, of operations. So you didn't you could go ahead and drill some holes in the OD if you needed to from a turned part. And then they got into rotary products. And then finally, when they hit uh, eighty eight with that first mill and took those orders, we picked them up uh, very shortly after it. I, I have to ask Bill. It may have may have even been at the IMTS show. Did a lot of that, you know, um, uh, mingling with with other people and seeing what what was out there in the industry. But um, back to that. Then they then it was like, how do we get to the point? And this is the deep thing. And when we get back past COVID, uh, to take you down there and hear this story from Bob, the passion he exudes is amazing. And he tells you, you went from fifty four machines. Then we were doing like a hundred a month and three hundred a month and. And the numbers just generated such a, a, a enormous, um, you know, now you have a, an American manufacturer. You had Fidal at the time, Cincinnati, Hardinge. They were still there, but they weren't going down this CNC path like Haas was. Hmm. So it was great. Um, so Haas does. They, they do a great job. Brand recognition. They have created that. They've been marketing geniuses from the beginning. You know, we would have a single page flyer or no flyer for a machine back in the day when we'd go to somebody's shop. And Haas... Their brochure was like 10 pages long. You saw the casting, you saw the <laughs> spindle, you saw how they cooled everything. And you're like, oh my God, this is great. And the customers would flip through this and go, this is awesome. Um, so again, back to that, Haas is great. Matt Suro is our bread and butter in terms of long standing. We've had him since 78. Bill Selway brought uh, Matt Suro into the uh, United States through a distributor, which was Methods Machine Tools back uh, in, in the 70s. Um, and uh, Matt Sura, they are just absolutely a phenomenal builder, a boutique builder. When you think of Matt Sura, you think of quality, the Japanese quality. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one thing I was going to ask you. So yeah. I saw in Selway's bio that um, you guys started using Japanese tools in the 70s. Yes. And so was that because, what was the specific reason to move towards that? See, well, you didn't have a lot of good builders back then. You had Kearney and Trekker and Cincinnati and Fidal and some of these, mm-hmm. you know, brands that had been around for a long Classical time. Classical brands. Ingenuity, yeah. right. And the, and the um, 
uh, the technological aspect, aspect that, that Japanese products brought to the industry were game changers. Speeds, feeds, ability to machine parts that were so accurate and, and have that uh, behind you was enormous. And, 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 and you had it in, you know, Kuma was out there. Mori was out there in their lathes. And then they came up, I think their first mill was... Oh, maybe it may, may have been the uh, mid-80s, uh, but Mazak was out there. You had a lot of these big brands, and ours was Matsura. Yeah, and hmm. and again, there I've been there. I've got to go see Matsura and see him from oh, ground wow. up. Yeah, it's a great, great, amazing facility, um, and uh, and they are just uh, awesome people. The the son, Katsu Matsura, took it over uh, from Mr. Matsura that, that started it back in the 30s. That's wow. fun. Yeah. You've and, been all over. Yeah. I know. Oh well, it's gosh. Yeah, I know this industry will do that to you. On, I think on this side of it, but again, even on 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 the manufacturing side, it's knowing where to go, like Fabtech yeah. or yeah. IMTS or Emo, and seeing always, you know, learning about the trade. You love it. This is what you do. It's good to have that knowledge. We've of. actually never been to Fabtech. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I think, I've really wanted yeah. to go, but it's never oh. been able to work out. In the yeah. Cars. Yeah. It's great. It just again, it's like a kid in a candy store. You there's yeah. so much to see. You know, I was just thinking it's kind of crazy back to Haas. Like Selway like really believed in Haas almost in their initial product launch. For, and for has sure. Had that NorCal contract in this area ever since then, huh? For sure. Wow. And and again, That's crazy. it is. When you think about it, you go back to Bill's vision of understanding what 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 would work and what might not, you know. I mean Take a big leap. And, yeah, and I mean, he must one. have seen something big. Yeah, you know? 100%. You know, an American, new American made. And the, the Haas story is an incredible American success story. I mean, mm -hmm. these guys, you know, they've got F1, they've got NASCAR, and yeah. they have wow. got one of the largest, you know, facilities. And they're moving into a new facility in Henderson, Nevada, I think 2022 20, or 23. Um, that Bob Murray said will be the most state-of-the-art facility on the planet in terms of manufacturing. And I wow. believe them. It, wow. it is amazing what they... I've seen some of the drawings and what they want to accomplish. Incredible. They're and I saw company. that Selway wow. is uh, one of the top three dealers. Yes. That's, yeah. That's amazing. For Haas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. We're always up at that top for market share and, and numbers. I mean, we sell a lot of equipment. And again, part of that is you have uh, an area that we all consider high-end manufacturing. Right. That's Silicon Valley, yeah. West Coast right. manufacturing. Course, yeah. Got it. That's exactly. Sure. We're not big like the automotive industry where you see, you know, uh, it was always funny. You know, you'd, we'd hear these stories. Oh, my God, this guy sold 20 machines to one customer on one sale. And it was always in Michigan or Detroit. Mm, yeah. I mean, uh, outside of Detroit. Setting up like a plant or something. You got yeah. it. Yeah. Or a big manufacturer that needs you know 20 horizontals and yeah. uh it, it's crazy but we do see a little bit of that out here so with some of the uh, newer customers is there any new equipment on the market that we need to know about anything up and kind more robots well <laughs> robots the collaborative robots are excellent you know you are universal robots are one of the leaders in the collaborative robots and then uh, of course fanuka is as well they they've got their brand of of collaboratives but you know printing you know the 3d printing is going to be uh i don't know if it will ever and i'm i might be speaking because i'm a little bit you know older in this in this industry with then maybe some of the younger guys that are into the 3d printing but I do believe it will have a very big, um, of course it will, um, impact in the industry. Will it ever take over machining? I don't know. It seems to me it's too slow compared to what, to what we can uh, produce on, on, mach on machine tools themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, of course, you've got the, 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 the issue with you know how accurate is the metal that they can. Will you have to f finish machine it like Matt Sura? Um, this is where it could go. And this is maybe what we call additive subtractive, right? So they add the metal to the machine so it's a metal printing machine and right. then they finish machine as it's printing so you're oh, wow. getting yes what a process. machine wow, that's in insane. both yeah in both really aspects it's it's printing and machining and so you do get a final product out of it the machine is amazing that's impressive yeah and i saw that when i was it was in a little door you couldn't you could look through the window but that was it when i was at matt sir i think back in 06 uh, they had that machine even back then. Mm. And now it's become more mainstream, a lot cheaper to produce. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing is you're going to see a lot of the 3D printing uh, enter our industry, which it already has, but I think on a larger scale. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the automation is just going to keep going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Linear motion. You know, you're going to get machines that are not going to have ball screws. They're going to be all linear motors. Um, so that's going to probably be something you'll see. 
down the line as a uh, as a maybe not a standard, but uh, on the higher end, we already have it, and it might filter down to that mid range machine. Mm -hmm. So some of those things that we'll see uh, attracting the the industry. And what do you see these machine manufacturers doing to make their equipment better? Oh, they're always. Uh, it's interesting that the the side of the machine tools. It's it's always speed and, and and what you're getting out of spindle RPM. Like right when I first started. Matsura was even a 6,000 RPM spindle. And now, you know, the machines I sell standard on Matsura's are all 20,000 RPM, or they have, you know, a 42,000 RPM die mold machine. And so you see speeds and feeds always increasing. And then stability of the machine in terms of uh, casting uh, design, just to make the machine more dampening, more rigid across the board. Um, it's those are the innovations that they'll continue to go through with five axis being that biggest uh, portion of, of the innovation. Um, but uh, we always see the the tooling and the software. If you look at the last probably 15 years, the machines have kind of grown to where they are speeds feeds when you have, uh, you know, a Haas, which cuts at, let's say a thousand inches per minute, like a VF2 SS, it's 833 inches per minute cutting feed rate. Mm -hmm. In an end shoe that I sell, which is an excellent Japanese builder, um, 90 year old company, but 3,600 inches per minute. Wow. You know, so you see Matsura at 2632 on their inches per minute. So, you know, the speeds will always get there, but then what has to keep up with that? The tooling. Right. So you can only move a tool so fast <laughs> through material. So, where we've seen a lot of the biggest changes, I think, along with five axis and, and live tool lays, multitasking lays, is the tooling the carbide the coatings on the tooling and the cam software that's made the machines really do their part in in advancing i think the software is super important because it makes it Huge. so much more sellable yes yeah. mm -hmm. like exactly what i was talking about with that robotic arm for the press break it's totally like, it's when you don't know when you're not a programmer and you don't know the information it's a lot less scary to invest a bunch of money in a piece of equipment you know 100 percent you can operate when it's one day training or yeah. two days training or actually, even a week like yeah the That's, influence on our laser purchase was just software yeah. side of how yeah. easy it is to program how easy it is to troubleshoot mm -hmm. you know kind of yeah. out of the gate capability versus like all right learn this for six months then let's start working you know, yeah exactly. the laser itself runs on a uh, like a windows 10 operating system so wow. I, we were talking the other day about like potential like contingencies hey what happens if we got shut down because of covid I'm like i i was i'm figuring out i i think i can actually run it remotely and just have no way <laughs> load, load, load and unload it so i can have people work from home programming yeah, it's fantastic it, you know hit go yeah and then make, just have someone there like shutting the door one and, at a time and, and yeah, yeah that's the thing Ripping if you're only yeah. here one at a time one person at a time that's fairly safe yeah yeah, yeah. now yeah. have you guys taken delivery delivery oh the, we've been we have, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 in august Man. maybe so, September, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, a couple months then. Yeah, three yeah. months. Yeah, that yeah. is. And how, so it's it's rocking, of course. Oh, it's rocking, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. I think we've only had, like, one, like, a, a Z-axis crash, like, just a vertical crash. It wasn't, like, a, yeah. wasn't, didn't offset the head. It just kind of hit the part. A little alarmed, bump. Alarmed out and said, hey, don't do that, you know, whatever. A little excessive load. And that's, <laughs> that, that's it. So we've been pretty lucky because it, uh, everyone's been telling us hey you will crash this machine good like, for just you heads guys up, you know so but we've they, one they, small one they've been really uh they've been really good about um just making everything safe. game changer for you we, guys i bet oh, yeah. yeah we talked oh, to a lot time. of uh we talked to like techs beforehand because like i've learned like even when buying like software like you, you know you talk to like a, say a salesman to buy a piece of software or whatever you're buying you need to talk to the people that are implementing it or people that uh, work on it yes say, hey what are, what are the mistakes people make with implementation so I've, we made a bunch of mistakes in the past not doing that. So <laughs> this time around, I I, call, I said, "Hey, let me talk to one of your technicians that works on these machines. Hey, on, what yeah. do you guys? How do you guys see people crashing these things?" And he says, "It's because of the programming, like always. Because if you're running over a part, you just cut and it flips up. You're going to crash it. Yeah. So you need to program it to where it you can mitigate those uh, those tool paths, not to not yeah. to go over another piece of material. No, that's a good call too. I I would, I would never I had a customer of mine. I was selling a lot of watchy on lays and again one of our good korean builders and uh customers uh, build them up talking about it live tool lathe and i get a call from bill eisman my my head service tech here in sacramento and he, and uh, he goes hey i was talking to uh, so and so about uh, the watchy and he asked me you know what do i know about him and 
His response was, I don't know anything, really, because I don't service them. He goes, they're so good, they're never down. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So I said, oh, that's a great, <laughs> that's but a great in my mind, have, I'm yeah. thinking the same thing. We don't service them that often. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. But that's always good to ask the text. Yeah. They're the ones that will give you the straights. Yeah, and it's, it's I think it's that that way with every, like every everything. Again, if it's yeah. software, you need to talk to the people that are implementing it and people that work on it. Not the people that always just, you know, sell it. And then and then they generally don't hear that much after that, you know. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Good That's, call. When we were in Chicago uh, a couple weeks ago, that was pretty nice to be able to get the help from Vestronic and stuff, talking to the guys that run it every day. And mm-hmm. it's pretty cool to hear, you know, their input on stuff and helping us through problems. Yeah. You know, so you got to go to Bystronic? Yeah. yeah. I bet that was cool. Yeah, they have a pretty cool we're facility. I'm cutting and bending yeah. products, you know, that we make here, DXF files. And it was pretty sweet. Very, very cool. Yeah. They also, when we, when we were purchasing it before we... We didn't go when we bought it. We we went after it after the, we we because bought the laser. Because of COVID. Oh, okay, yeah. sure, sure, sure. And yeah. also just because we're just in, yeah t- time time limits and all that. And uh, oh, they let us tour facilities of customers. Oh, which we cool because that was local. Yep. And we could just take a drive down, go go view them, which was really nice because we actually got to deal with the customers and say, hey, what do you like? What don't you like about these? That's the best. Um, and and we got like some really really good feedback. Yeah. One of them was actually a vendor of ours, so he's oh, like, no way, this product here is this hard to make yeah. so here's how you do it you know? very <laughs> people helping cool. people it's Hold very up. nice because they could have just been like forget it yeah oh yeah. you yeah. guys uh, what you just said hits home mm-hmm. i i when i first got into this industry and you'd take people to customer shops and show machines of course we have a showroom but you know they want to see a machine running and they want to see it yeah. real time making yeah. parts and people back in the day would cover their prints and the yes. machine would barely even be running it'd be lucky if it was but you'd be able to show it to them <laughs> definitely today Oh my God, it was so much better. People, hey, if you end up getting this machine, call me if you need any uh, help. You know, yeah. they're so um, good about just putting themselves out there to lend a hand if yeah. needed. Mm-hmm. It has changed almost a full 180 from when I started. Yeah. Total support behind it in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's really, cool. really nice. Yeah. I want to know um, what are a lot of, what, what business are a lot of your customers in? I mean, I know you talked about medical, yeah. but I mean, what's the, What's the variety? Is it all over the place? It's all over the place. I mean, I sell machines across the board. And again, our Sacramento region, if you just take uh, my my territories, uh, Stockton, North of Reading, East of Nevada, and I have all of Northern Nevada, and you would find mostly defense, uh, aerospace, Mm -hmm. medical, and firearms. So those four generally make up probably, I'm going to say, a good... Uh, probably 80% of the industry. And then the others are aftermarket, you know, aftermarket automotive, whether it's uh, motorcycle, um, truck car parts, what you guys do off road. Um, uh, it covers a wide range. And, and then you have probably a very small percentage of just standard every day. I need this built. You know, we see a lot in the ag industry. If I go mm-hmm. uh, just north of Yuba City, and I start heading to Chico and Oroville and up to or, uh, Redding and, and, and Anderson, uh, you get a lot of ag industry and those people are awesome. You get, you know, some of my best customers, you know, tree shakers, almond shakers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's cool. You know, those are things that you don't see when you're down in the Silicon Valley. And yeah. and you get uh, just, again, a gr- great group of people. But um, that that's probably it. Mostly, though, again, uh, aerospace, defense, medical and firearms make up the most of our industry mm-hmm. around this area. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's it's got to be a good feeling to know that you're helping contribute to the medical field to make these oh. super intricate, interesting things that are saving lives. So I'm cool. sure it's so cool. Yeah. Everything is even even when you talk about aerospace uh, and and when you see very good customers locally. You know, Aerojet moved out of the area, but yeah. I, a lot of customers still do a lot of work for them in SpaceX oh, and Virgin yeah. Galactic and Virgin Hyperloop, and you've got so many budding industries as well in in aerospace and what we're going to see in the terms of future travel um uh and then the the defense side uh, you know one of our best customers in the sacramento region probably one of the larger employers is kratos defense mm-hmm. and they make unmanned aerial drones and you want to talk about uh I should say uavs that's what unmanned aerial vehicles <laughs> uh but they are amazing an amazing company amazing people that work there um, and, and they've been doing this for a long time. There was a, a gentleman and his wife, Mike and Amy Fournier, that owned Composite Engineering, and they sold out to Kratos um, and developed uh, the product of which now is now they've got tactical drones and they've got um, just this amazing um, um, display of, of product. 
Uh, but they're one of the largest manufacturers here in our region, but you wouldn't know it, right? right. Who mm. knows who Kratos Defense, Kratos Defense is, but they're right here in our backyard. Mm. I actually heard of that company. I didn't know they were local, though. Yeah, That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. I saw a video on your guys' website that said why we should not fear 5-axis. Yeah. <laughs> why should we not fear it? it well, two things. It, it, I think that what Zach made a, a point to earlier was uh, just the ease of programming. You know, getting you know back again when you're talking 5-axis maybe years ago, the programming wasn't up to speed. The work holding wasn't up to speed. You had... Uh, really, uh, one of our first customers that bought one of the very first MAMs, which are the 35V that I mentioned earlier from Matsura, um, they're down in Burbank, and the Raptor product mm. came from their MAM. So mm. they needed something to hold all their all their uh, jobs in, and they came up with that vice for the MAM. So you have these people that way back when were starting 5-axis, and it was a struggle. It was a struggle for us. It was new to us. But now today with the work holding, the software and the machines ease of use comparatively 20 years ago, totally don't fear. It is the way things are going. I even had a customer here recently told me, he goes, I think even engineers are designing around five axis more. They are knowing that the, the, the technology and the machines are out there and they're designing a little bit more mm. around five axis. So that is a huge thing that you could jump into and say, God, this makes sense. Now I don't have to set it up, you know, seven out part. Now I can do it in two instead of seven. And that saves time, money, and everything across the board. It's the way of the future. It is by far. So to we want to wrap this up, but before we do, you promised us some scary stories. Oh, oh I'm looking forward <laughs> to my this. Gosh, yeah. So in your 28 years, you yeah. told us about, before we started recording, you told us about one you saw in person, and then you told us about one about a year in on yes. your job. So why don't you tell us those stories? Oh, so machining is, is one of those things that, you know, you always have to be aware of your surroundings, right? It's a dangerous industry. You're using high-speed machines with razor sharp cutters and <laughs> it's like a scary movie it, just it, starting yeah <laughs> and so uh yeah, i heard stories of of parts lifting out of it that weren't, weren't set in a vice and going through the window Flinging. back then you had plastic windows i mean you oh. didn't have uh, temper proof glass that will hold that part in so you know uh, parts flying out of machines and guys that had long hair and ponytails being and wrapped oh. up in a spindle and oh ripping and but the two that i'll never forget uh so just about yeah as mallory said it's maybe i was six months in eight months in and a customer of ours down in santa clara bought a uh, nakamura tome lathe from us and um and uh put a piece of bar stock in the back side of the machine and uh, i would say from again what i remember hearing it was about maybe three foot out the back of the machine which cool. is a no-no i mean you got a small you know, piece of material, round stock. So this guy whips it right up to 4,000 RPM and that thing just spun, twisted, and came out of the machine and decapitated him. Took his out. The whole piece came out? Whole, so it was like and, a long nunchuck? Yeah, kind of? could, could have been, yeah, something <laughs> very similar to that. And it just spun and then went through the wall and it just was... Yeah, and I remember the shop today and where it was and uh, the rumors of it. Yeah, brutal, brutal. Um, and then the uh, the one that I was actually, uh, uh, that I got to see, we were up in Chico doing a demo for a, um, a company that was making um, railway switching equipment. It was a long course uh, thread on a, on a gnarly piece of steel. And the guy was having trouble because it was vibrating so much. And we were in an open lathe. It was a, a Haas TL machine. So it was open lathe. And, and he's sitting there trying to get the vibration down. So he gets a piece of brass and he puts it on the on the part to to uh, keep it from you know moving around a little bit and and he's got this droopy uh sweatshirt, sweatshirt on yeah and he's over it with the uh brass and then we're just bsing on the side the owner and my other uh guy that runs the shop and we heard the back brass drop into the casting of the lathe and we turn and look and this guy's getting pulled into the lathe his shirt his sweatshirt got caught on that thread and it really if it wasn't going so slow and it would have turned another full rotation. It would have taken his arm out. So he, oh. he stopped, thank God. 
and he was white as a ghost. Oh, I yeah. was sitting there going, oh my, what did I just see? I've heard about all these and yeah. I'm right in yeah. front of one. Yeah, gnarly. Oh, very, very crazy. So, so always be careful yeah. when you're machine. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's some sort of rhyme or rule or something, but it's like check anything long. Yes. Make sure you're wearing your safety glasses. Totally. Mm-hmm. All of those things. All Pay attention. We even Double check, triple check. Good call on the safety glasses. Guy was just telling me the other day who doesn't wear them that often and he got a new machine and something happened with the uh high pressure coolant pump and it Ooh. and it he had his glasses on and a line moved and it hit him right in the he goes keith he goes i didn't have my glasses on i would have been literally maybe blinded in one eye oh, yeah. kind of weird just yeah. happened loose fitting yeah oh my gosh yikes yeah buckle up yeah. <laughs> i mean when you buy a machine it comes with other added, you know, responsibilities mm-hmm. that I think people forget about. So completely agree. Goodness. Completely agree. Well, thank you so much for spending this time oh, with us yeah, and answering all of my questions. Yeah, this thank was you guys. So much fun. Super so good. If people want to get a hold of you, how can they do that? Where are you located? So I'm out at Roseville, and uh, you could either uh, call or email uh, kgrano at selwaytool.com or uh, reach out via text or email or anytime. We'll put your information put in the bio of our. In, that's of our podcast. That okay. sounds awesome. Well, thank you so much. It thank was really fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Appreciate yeah. being here. Really, really good. appreciate Thanks, your time. Guys. Absolute. Keep going. Hell yeah. Yeah. More Hell machines, yeah. not more pallets. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal, right? Yeah, correct. All right. Thank you, guys. So you. if you want to use our coupon code for 10% off, you can use code Rough Stuff Podcast on our website anytime. And also, if you want to email us any feedback, information, questions, concerns, anything like that, you can email us podcast at roughstuffinc.com.